This is the world that you know. The world as it was at the end of the 20th century. It exists now only as part of a neural interactive simulation that we call the Matrix. You've been living in a dream world, Neo. This is the world as it exists today. Welcome to a method to the madness. Hello and welcome to our Matrix Quadrilogy series. I'm your host, Mitchy, and joining me as always is Patrick. Hello. And David. Good to be back. So, we're back for the second Matrix film, eh? The Matrix Reloaded, as it's called. All of them now follow with a with a second word beginning with R. Right? True. Yeah. Yeah, what an observation that is. Cinema facts. So, <laughs> yep. So... I didn't realize that this movie came out in 2003, but this is a 2003 film, which is four years after the first one, which is a very long gap considering the the, uh, the break between this one and the third one. Directed by the Wachowskis, as always, and starring Keanu Reeves, Carrie Ann Moss, Lawrence Fishburne, Hugo Weaving. I didn't even change those actor that actor list from the first movie because they're still pretty much the core characters, right? Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, so The Matrix Reloaded is an interesting sequel and i'm actually very interested to hear what you both think about it because i don't know the first one's kind of always talked about as the best one and in some ways this one's actually really good in other ways not so much Mm -hmm. so what were your experiences who who started last time Uh, i want to pick the other person Uh, i I did last time yeah so it'd be pat this time all right pat what was your first impression of this film when did you actually watch it first um, I think first time I watched it was in 2017. What? Because um, <laughs> I, I didn't made you watch the first one as a kid. Yeah, I did. Just the first one. <clears throat> Interesting. And if you recall, I I didn't. I wasn't a fan, so I was like, no, well, yeah. no, I'm not gonna watch the other ones. Um, I I really liked it the first that first time I watched it, and I like it even more this second time I've watched it. I think this is actually kind of a fantastic sequel. Not gonna lie, um, it's it has a vision like morpheus and like the oracle it knows it has a direction and it's so bold and like it, it's it really swings for the fences um i think the in true sequel like fashion it tries to one up a lot of things from the first movie some things it some of those elements it succeeds in i i would argue the the a lot of the fighting the choreography and stuff like that it, it's so ridiculous and anime and it you get what you mm. pay for if if you're a fan of the first matrix and you're like you know you're keen to watch the sequel i think it delivers on a lot of those fronts um uh yeah i i, I really liked it i was also struck by how dune like the plot is about <laughs> about like um uh, prophecies yeah. and messiahs um being yeah, fabricated true. by an architect if you will you know it's <laughs> there's 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 big orgies in caves um this is there's a lot of dune in this movie which uh, makes me orgies. makes me wonder if the wachowski's a big dune fan <laughs> is there a big orgy are. in a cave in dune uh in the book not in the not in yeah the film. in the book yeah. oh okay of course it would be in the book i mean the, uh, yeah. the design yeah. is very like is like very 80s science fantasy as well like the 70s 80s science fantasy just with the like the sh- you know the the ships themselves you know like everything in zion mm-hmm. is very much you know it's it's in conversation with things like alien which are in conversation with you know your sort of gene wolf your book of the new sun that kind of era of science fantasy so like which is fundamentally all cribbing off of june right so it's it's it kind of all in that same um category of like yeah like same origin of where all this aesthetic yeah. and ideas comes from so it's it's not surprising yeah yeah i agree i think maybe lo-fi would be a way to describe the the sci-fi uh trend uh that was started by doing but yeah uh, i i really thoroughly thoroughly enjoyed this film i remember not 
enjoying the next one as much. But um, but it's it's uh, it, this was so good. It's got me <laughs> really keen to watch the next one. So yeah, those are my thoughts on it. And what do you think uh, about June Part Two? I mean, Matrix Reloaded. <laughs> Uh, David <laughs> Oh hang on Can I do this Can I I can probably make these line up uh, I think both <laughs> Hang on L- Let me do it So you can't tell Which film I'm talking about Alright <laughs> Pat will know Because he knows me well enough But um, I think As a sequel It might be one of the more Structurally sound Stories That I've come across In a long time The okay. energy Of the film Is charged At every turn And While there are things That I don't necessarily understand the motivation behind the decisions of where it lands for me coming back to it now is I'm obsessed with all the ideas in it, even if maybe it's not the perfect film for me um, in the same way that the original film was. Yep. Mm -hmm. Uh, Surely you mean Matrix Matrix. Reloaded, because I'm pretty sure last time you said Dune Part 2 was perfect. Yeah, I think, yeah, that's correct. Yes, it is. (laughs) So good. It's a perfect picture. Um, Yeah. yeah. Can we just talk about that instead? (laughs) Guys, what if we just talked about Dune Part 2? No, I I have mixed thoughts about this film. When I first saw it as a kid, um, same way I saw the the first one, it would have been a DVD on my dad's couch. Um, It... I didn't understand it at all. Like I, like I knew what the mm. plot was, but I didn't get what the film was about. And to what Pat just said, I think over the years, the more I've come back to it, the more I've gotten from it. And it's kind of rare, I think, for films of this era to have that kind of staying power. But depending on the the phase you're in in your life and the kinds of, especially you know, studying media and thinking about media and the current disciplinary interests you have being able to come back to a film like this and always get something meaningful and different uh, mm. and valuable, I think is, is a real testament to what Pat said, which is this, this feels like such a specific effort. Like it's so charged with vision and idea and mm. it, there, there's like a, there's a specificity to everything here that is, is so exact that I, I find it really, um really captivating. And yeah, I, I think I have a similar feeling about some of the action um but then at, a, at the same time it's like what's well, supposed to be deliberately ridiculous in moments so i, I don't mind it so much now mm. yeah what about yeah. you Mitchy? what's 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 your vibe I, I agree with you that watching it as a young person as a kid for me um is yeah it was confusing ask it's kind of, especially the ending um like you understand the plot but yeah, exactly what's going on is actually quite complicated. And I'm sure we'll get into that during this podcast. Um, but I, I loved it otherwise. Um, I mean, obviously, as a kid, you don't really think about that kind of shit anyway, right? You just, just watch it because it's cool and and take things at face value and, and um, get impressed by that. But yeah, this is such a good sequel. Like, I don't know. I've, I've seen it a few, many times and a few times I'm, always, I'm like, oh, this isn't that interesting. But then other times I get really excited by it. I don't know why, uh, but yeah, just the action alone in this movie is like so good, <laughs> you know, and that's enough reason to kind of watch it really, let alone the actual plot itself and, and all the other bits and pieces are actually really great as well. So mm. yeah, no, I, um, in terms of it, comparing it to the first one, it's, maybe the first one's a little bit more original to me, um, you know, cause it's, it lays out this, this wacky plot, but the second one's like a really good sequel, and I think it's in better in some regards. I think it hoists a lot of those ideas into interesting places that the first just can't, because it's the first, right? Mm. Yeah. yeah, the first is about that like growth of Neo and his journey, but the second one is, you know, become the one, and then you can kind of explore a lot of those ideas, what it means to be like a messiah and stuff. Very much like... Uh, Part one until June, actually. Ah, weird. Mm-hmm. Weirdly enough. <laughs> mm-hmm. 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 Um, anyway, before we get into it, should we uh, read through a plot summary? Uh, yeah, let's do it. Give me one sec. Okay. Six months after the events of The Matrix, a new threat emerges. The machines are tunneling to the last human bastion of Zion to eliminate them. An emergency call of all Zion's ships is made, but Morpheus defies those orders directing a ship to stay behind to wait on the Oracle. 
In Zion, there are mixed views on Morpheus's faith in the prophecy of the One. Many believe, and others don't, but Morpheus's recalcitrance is overlooked due to the potentiality of the prophecy. Neo meets the Oracle, learning she, among many others, are programs just like their enemies. She instructs him to reach the source of the Matrix, which he needs the Keymaker for. As he leaves, he is attacked by Smith, who has become a rogue program after his destruction by Neo, and is copying himself into all areas of the Matrix. He also earlier asserted himself onto Bane, a human, taking over his mind in the real world. Neo Morpheus and Trinity meet the Merovingian, who has imprisoned the Keymaker. With no help from the Merovingian, his frustrated wife Persephone hands over the Keymaker in exchange for a kiss from Neo. They leave with the Keymaker, but not without a fight on the freeway with the Merovingian's forces and the agents. Now with the Keymaker, Neo is able to access the Source. An elaborate plan between the crews of the Nebuchadnezzar, Vigilant, and Logos is made. However, Sentinels destroy the Vigilant, thwarting the plan and forcing Trinity into the Matrix, despite Neo's ongoing premonitions of her death. The plan is executed successfully, and Neo reaches the source where he encounters the architect, the designer of the Matrix. He divulges that the idea of the prophecy and the One is all merely part of the machine's control over humanity. Neo is the sixth iteration of the One. Each time the One is given a choice, restart the cycle, allowing the destruction of their Zion for the birth of a new one, or break it, resulting in the extinction of humanity. Neo, driven by his unique love for Trinity, makes the unprecedented choice of the latter. Neo is able to save Trinity against his earlier premonitions. When they leave the Matrix, they are forced out of the Nebuchadnezzar as it is destroyed by Sentinels. Escaping by foot, Neo unexpectedly destroys the Sentinels with some sort of power, but is injured in the process. They are saved by the Hammer, which has escaped a planned counterattack gone awry, which had only one survivor. The Smith-controlled Bane. Whoa, I, what a, I, like, yeah. Can I just say that I didn't, I forgot about the thing about Smith possessing that guy. And in the few shots of Bane in the movie, I just assumed he was like, he was like <laughs> Cypher from the last movie. He was just an evil dude. I completely forgot guy. about the fact that yeah, he was he, Smith entered him. I, I couldn't as a kid. I literally um interpret the idea that somehow a computer program like Smith could take control of a human in the supposed real world, right? Mm. And so I was always just confused. Like, is Bane actually controlled by Smith? Is he actually Smith, or is he just gone crazy, or what? Like, I just couldn't. But I think the general kind of idea here is is that he really is Smith. He, at least yeah, to, yeah, to yeah. a degree enough that you know he's he's going to thwart neo's plans and whatnot like he tries to kill him right and and obviously he's had something to do with the counterattack that went wrong at the end of the movie um Wait, what a seems, cliffhanger it seems like he it seems like he might have orchestrated the emp that went off that killed the five ships right um, yeah yeah and, and so there's this kind of but to your point like i mean the thing is, that this film is the film is ostensibly about keys uh, and the types of locks for which they are built, and by extension, like what machines are and what people are, as it relates to keys and locks. Right? Uh, yeah. The the keymaker is the a central figure who he kind of crafts the key. It, it's not the summary because it's one of those like really specific details, but he he crafts all of the keys in this kind of. Um, it's almost like a back office, like subnet um, kind of corridor in the matrix that lets you transverse from different parts of the matrix to other parts of the matrix. And there's back a very, rooms. Yeah, the back rooms, exactly. And there's specific <laughs> keys that get created that let you open some of those doors and the key maker is the program that can create the keys, right? And he's also the person that makes the key that gives Neo access to the source, right? It, it's all kind of it's all infused into that question of like, and you know, in that last confrontation, Smith gets into the back, the, you know, the, the, the back corridors, the, the back rooms, um, he, you know, he gets in, into a place that he shouldn't be able to get into because he's mm. gone so rogue, um, that he's almost like rewriting the matrix uh, with his own kind of 
uh, desires and his own motivations in the same way that he rewrites Bane into being himself, which is like rewriting reality, as it were. Mm. Yeah, but I guess um, the thing about the people that can be plugged into the Matrix is that they are part machine, aren't they? I mean, they, they must be because they got a bloody big thing port in the back of their head and then they can be plugged directly into a computer. So it kind of makes sense that he can be hacked, I suppose. Yeah, well, I think through the, electronic general, means. the general like vagueness and the question of exactly what, you know, your your kid self thought, Michi, of like, well, how how can he be hacked if he's in the real world? Like hmm. that that seems to be in conversation with what's going on in the rest of the movie about the relationship between systems and things outside that system. Mm. Um, uh, you know, like, as you said, like if there are rules in the matrix that, you know, certain keys open certain locks, but then there's something like agent Smith who can just enter the the back rooms anyway. Um, but you know, yeah. his, his, the ability to do that is an anomaly of the system, which, you know, is, can't be created without the system in the first place, which, you know, is, you could frame it as all part of a larger system encompassing all those rogue elements plus the thing that's meant to go right um so you know there's uh, there's like a, there's like some mirroring going on there i think well, in all parts yeah. of this movie yeah that's the conversation that hammond and neo have right which is um mm. hammond hammond goes uh, i'll give you the dialogue because i think it exactly exemplifies what you're talking about so hammond hammond uh councilman hammond and neo it's after the big orgy um, and neither of them can sleep. Um, and Councilman Hammond says, down here, sometimes I think about all those people still plugged into the Matrix. And when I look at these machines, I can't help thinking that in a way, we are plugged into them. Neo. Mm. But we control these machines. They don't control us. Hammond. Of course not. How could they? The idea is pure nonsense. But it does make one wonder. Just what is control? Neo. If we wanted, we could shut these machines down. Hammond, oh, of course, that's it, you hit it, that's control, isn't it? If we wanted, we could smash them to bits, although if we did, we'd have to consider what would happen to our lights, our heat, and our air. Neo, so we need machines and they need us, is that your point, Counselor? Hammond, no, no point. Old men like me don't bother with making points. There's no point. So the, the, there's this kind of, there's this kind of like schematic thing happening with you know the first first film is really about reflections and like what the nature of reality as like you said at the start mitchy if the first film is about establishing the one this film is about what it means to be the one and what it means for someone like smith to be able to manipulate the matrix in the same way even if it's not the same mechanisms but in the same kind of um uh being able to corrupt the code change it to your desire you know neo and smith occupy similar positions it's just that neo is a human and Smith is a, is a um, machine until he, Mm. until he isn't, until he is uploaded into someone's brain. And then it's like, what's the difference between a human and a machine at that point, which is kind of how the stories are very parallel, aren't they? Yeah. Yeah. They're both resurrected Mm. and then, and then become something more powerful through that. Yeah. Which is sort of interesting given the whole Messiah thing. Like, and that's, that's sort of where I think the, um, People reading this as sort of a, you know, the 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 Western conception of prophecies and you know the Jesus myth and all those kinds of things. I think that's where it deliberately falls apart and becomes its own thing. Like it's not trying to make a point about that. Um, yep. You know, it's 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 sort of going, hey, like think about this stuff, and that's very much in the same mode of the contemporaries of what we were just talking about at the start of like the aesthetic influence, right? There are multiple characters. There's a character in particular called Jonah in Book of the New Sun uh, by Gene Wolfe, who uh, across the course of the books, you start to realize subliminally, even though he presents as a person and is treated like a person, this guy's a fucking android robot that's been built, but no one can tell the difference until a moment when you can. And that's kind of the same thing with Bane and Neo, right? Because when Bane is first occupied by Smith, they have that very brief interaction in Zion and it's like very clear that Smith doesn't quite understand how people talk to each other um, in that moment. Do you know what I mean? Like, it's just a weird exchange. And then it's it's the kid who comes in and gives Neo the spoon that disrupts the weirdness. He's also about to shank him too. He's going to stab that. Stab our boy Keanu. Yeah. 
but old mate saved him. With the young fella. Something um, about spoons and knives and there's something that cut. What is the next film? Is someone's going to bring out a fork. Well, it's, when it's was a there a knife? to the last film, right? Yeah. No, I know. Isn't it? I'm sorry. I was, okay, okay. I was being, I was <laughs> being oh, genuinely funny. confused. A joke. <laughs> well, but the spoon in the uh, the I literally in in my essay I literally include the clip about the spoon pack. Could you imagine? Yeah, if I, I know. Forgotten? I know. That's like, why. Wow, I, that's... I, yeah, I suppose. I suppose you're right. I like the um. I don't know. This movie kind of focuses on drawing those metaphors between like actual programming. And things in the real world, or sorry, not the real world, in the Matrix. Like, uh, you know, we're talking about this key maker dude who can access the back doors and stuff like that. And it's just funny because, like, the Matrix is all a program, just a computer program, and everything's coded. And this guy's just like literally cutting keys in the manifestation of that world, which is the Matrix, in order to kind of like access these back doors, which would in a programming equivalent sense would just be some lines of code, right? Mm -hmm. Or like um, when the Merovingians talking about that cake, which, uh, you know, we should probably discuss that that slice of cake uh, because it's very peculiar. I have a whole dot point about the Merovingians. (laughs) Sorry, I have have a whole subsection in my notes about him so we can get to him. Well, he he writes the cake, right? That's how he describes it. Like I wrote it myself, not not baked it myself, you know, because that's not what you do in a Matrix, but it's like in the Matrix, but it's like... um, it's just interesting, like like the the analogies of code are being applied to these the ostensibly real things in the Matrix. Of course, they aren't because the Matrix is all code anyway. Um, but those parallels seem to be drawn a lot more in this movie. I noticed. Mm-hmm. Well, and, there's and one curious. There's one big one in the first film, which is the trace program that is the red pill, right? That true. In particular, that's true. like the big one. Um, yeah, but yeah. You're right. Here, it's like everything is is that uh, or it calls your attention to it a lot more clearly um and, I, and it's I, interesting I, because it's like so you can take physical actions in the matrix world to kind of basically do the equivalent of coding like cutting keys in a certain way like maybe i'm reading into it too literally but like that's how it's portrayed right he cuts keys literally and then and then they are able to access places and it's like i i guess that's the point, like all the physical aspects. I mean, that's what they say when the, what the Oracle talks about, like everything's a program. There was a program for the birds that are in front of them. There's programs for the way the wind moves. And so the whole world is just a bunch of script, really. Um, yeah, I, I think the fact that everything is so stylized when they're in the Matrix, you know, they've got their cool jackets on and stuff like that. I think it's supposed to call, supposed to call your attention to like the dreamlike quality of the Matrix and therefore, like, you, you know, like, the way I, I take that, like, him cutting keys is, is it is deeply more symbolic than literal. And, like, I feel like that's kind of adequately set up by the, by the rest of the film. But it's, mm, it's like, yeah. particularly mythic, though, because it's, like, sort of, it, it, it becomes back, comes back to the question that the architect poses, which is, like, or, or that Nia raises in the conversation with the architect, which is, like, it, you know, it's both the beginning and the end, right? The key maker making the cutting a key um, yep. relies on the fact that a lock already exists, that he knows it will fit, but that's like impossible because how would you ever know? Because there's so many doors in the back rooms, right? And so it's this kind of like, to your point about this, it being related to code, Mitchy, it's like he, in cu- in cutting the keys, he's understanding the material structure of the matrix you know in particularly that if we take the locks to be literal locks which maybe we do maybe we don't he has knowledge enough of that framework in order to do that reliably for particular doors and that's kind Hmm. of where it's like the elision of how reality works for us and how the simulation of the matrix the stylized version right because to your point pat in reality to cut a key you need the lock to exist. Like you cut, it's the same mold. You, you have the mold that is the lock. And then the key is created based on that mold, not the other way around, but in the matrix, it's the opposite. And that's kind of that dreamlike, um, aspect to it. Hmm. Yeah. On the, just cause I brought it up before and I have a point about it uh, on the, the, you know, how in the first one, it's the red pill, 
um, that they take, and that's the trace program. Did you guys pick up on the fact that when uh, Neo goes to see the Oracle, uh, that uh, she's eating red pill shaped candy that she yeah, offers to him? Weren't they like little sticks? The little red I, kind of. I think it looked like that because it was in a wrapper or something, maybe. Oh, like okay. But, I thought they were like long, long like. I don't yeah, know, yeah, like yeah. some sort of Willy Wonka sweet thing. <laughs> but 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 then she takes one as well, and then you can see it in her hand, and it looks like looks like a regular pill. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. And she says, "Yeah." She goes, "The um, she goes programs doing. I don't. This isn't verbatim. It's just the thrust of what she says. She says programs doing what they're meant to do are invisible. Every story about vampires, werewolves, or aliens is the system. Uh, in the system is programming hacking. Is programs hacking programs?" And then she, and he's like, that doesn't make any sense to me. And she goes, what if I put it this way? You've already made the choice. Now you have to understand it. That's what being the one is. You have to. And it's like, you've already made the choice. Like in the same way that like, if the key maker has to make the key for the lock, the lock has to already exist. Hmm. Like it, it's, I don't know what to make of any of it. It's just, you know, it's, it's all there very vividly in the, in the film itself. It, it it there's come kind of like uh, some parallels with what she tells oh actually what what the kid tells neo in the first movie about don't think about bending the spoon no you already have you know it's kind of on the same lines of know that you've already made this decision um and and you know the the your power of bending the spoon is figuring out like the why um if you know if you if you already know something is predestined then the real power comes of knowing how you get there kind of and yeah. yeah and deciding what it means for yourself instead of letting someone tell you what it means right because that's the conflict with the architect is he saying this was all out of your control the whole time and mm. neo goes and neo goes well that's it isn't it it's choice because it's like if if you let the architect tell you what it means then you're doomed to be stuck in the predetermined cycle and so the I think in my essay for this film, I ended up sort of saying um, it's about keys and locks and it's about the monsters that try to tell you what that means. And it's like, yeah, because the machines are trying to tell you what the matrix means and what being the one means and what these cycles mean and what Zion means and what this decision means, right? He even says, like, you have to accept that Trinity is already dead kind of thing. And, like, hmm. Neo's like, no, like, fuck you. Like, I'm not... I'm, I choose, you know, it's, it's like what we said with, um, Descartes, I think therefore I am right for Neo. It's like, cause I have the ability to choose. That means I can decide what the decisions mean, not you, you, the machines don't get to tell me I do. I make the choices and that's the same for, for a Smith, right? Did, did I misinterpret that last scene, um, with the architect? Because I thought, I mean, in your in your uh, summary there, it says, "Yeah, um, yeah, we should unpack this scene." Yeah, uh, Neo, driven by his unique love for Trinity, makes the unprecedented choice of the latter. I mean, is that is it unprecedented? Is that not the choice he made those other times? Because well, it's not him, because they're they're just previous ones. Yeah, yeah, and they, but, okay. presumably they all did the same thing every but time. They, but they didn't have. A relationship so the the thing yeah. the, the thing no he love. says it, there's no oh, love right okay. so his point is like they felt a driving connection to humanity oh, as a whole oh yeah yeah okay which can, is can, yeah. yeah sorry no i was just gonna say i think that's the crucial difference or at least that's how the architect pitches it being different the because... reason why this scene is so difficult to understand though even as an adult is the bloody architect man? His vocabulary is like a bloody scholar or some shit. Like he's, t- <laughs> I don't yeah. know. Like, do you notice a major difference in the script with the way he speaks versus the rest of the movie? Like, he's using very like technical English. I mean, I wonder why as a kid I found that scene like unintelligible. Yeah, yeah. He, I noticed very, the difference. Like, yeah, who I says a pro pro like yeah. <laughs> apropos? Um, apropos. I'm the type yeah. of motherfucker that says apropos. Yeah, um, I know you are. Uh, yeah, so you can, me, both of you probably like just didn't even think about it. I'm like, bloody hell, like, like but, who actually uses the word ergo, you know, like. But, but that's part of the effect of, that's what he's trying to do, Mitchie, right, to Neo. He's trying yeah, to yeah. overwhelm him 
Yeah, and no, it's it's actually really well done. I, I appreciate yeah. it. But it yeah. is that, and that's what I. That's this stuff is really important to the plot, and that's what I failed to understand as a kid. Um, so yeah, I get it. Yeah, just by the nature of his English, it's funny. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay. So to sort of to tackle that scene, then is the fact that um, he the architect seems up to date and savvy with this new element of Neo's love for Trinity. And, you know, when Neo makes the, you know, so apparently unprecedented choice to go to the other door and save her, he completely, bre- like, breaks down that motivation, like, um, exactly, of, like, oh, you know, you, uh, your love for, you know, you, for another specific person is so overwhelmingly powerful that it, you know, it, it bypasses your, you know, your logic and reason. And um, this, is his, this is his claim. We're not necessarily mm. to take it as being true. This is what the architect says, but yes, with you said. Yeah, right. Well, I mean, given the nature of, um, you know, predestiny and and things being governed by systems, are, are we meant to have some doubt in our mind that this was part of the plan? That this unprecedented turn? Yeah, yeah. I think so. Yeah, um, it I, makes sense. Yeah, it, it. This. This. This is a. This is a thing that could happen, and so the Oracle has probably planned for it or thought about it because she's the one that's designed this loop, right? Mm-hmm. Oh, okay, and it's, yeah. Do you know what I mean? So it's sort of like, and we don't know the answer to that yet, and we might get an answer in the third film, but what I would say um, to to kind of unpack, to unpack the way that I take this scene is the architect goes, hey, this has all happened. This is a cycle that you're unaware of that no one's aware of. And that's what Neo says. He's like, either no one knows. And then he's like, yeah, well, cause we fucking kill everyone. <laughs> um, and the, the question then is like, if all of this is predestined or, you know, if, if everyone leaving the matrix is part of the design, if a mathematical anomaly, like the one appearing, if the prophecy is the lie told by the machines, then the question of the scene is Neo deciding what being the one means. And it's mm-hmm. unclear if making that decision is unprecedented or not. But the way that the film frames it, or the way the architect frames it, rather, is that it is an un- unprecedented decision. Because if every other one had made that choice, humanity would be dead. Yeah. So it's sort of impar- like It's apparent, again, should we trust these unreliable narrators? But like that's kind of the supposition here of... Is this a decision Neo is making to go and save Trinity, or is this what always happens? Like we don't know yet. Yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah. I, I without, the... without knowing about the third film, yeah. 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 That, that's the cool trick of this film is that <laughs> there's uh, Neo, who is an unpre- who is an anomaly in this otherwise harmonious system, uh, is you know finds the creator of it and is and he it's revealed that no his his anomalous nature is actually all is actually a part of the plan it's actually part of a larger harmony and then mm. the fact that he chooses to again go against um the the script is you know because there was already a case there was already a precedent set that you know uh breaking outside of the system is itself part of the system that's sort of like the essence of this film right it's the it's like well, you, yeah. you, you, the audience is left with like, oh, fuck, was this part of the bigger plan? Yeah. And he, Neo calls the architect's bluff, right? Because the architect is like, hey, you you wouldn't let me go through that door because then you, like, you need humans to survive. And the architect's bluff is he's like, there are levels of survival that we're prepared to accept. <laughs> yeah, I yeah. love that line. <laughs> I don't think that's true. Um, like, I don't think that's true. And because he immediately follows it with like, however... The relevant issue is whether or not you're ready to accept the responsibility for the death of every human being in this world. And if the question is about Neo's choice, he's choosing to decide, actually, that's that's horseshit. They're so afraid of us breaking the cycle because they need mm. us in a way that we don't need them in the same way. Which goes back to that conversation um, with the counselor where he's sort of saying we rely on machines just as they rely on us, but it's a different mm. form of reliance right it's a they need humans to be enslaved and to be plugged in and we need machines to do the same thing for us right which is 
not thinking, not knowing what the real, you know, if you think about like a, the micro, the, the mix boards that are running the microphones that we're talking on, they don't think or feel, they just provide power and utility to a thing we do. And humans in the matrix are functionally the same thing, except there's this dream that they inhabit. But we, mm. this is a ridiculous sentence, but to illustrate my point, we don't know for sure that my Rodecaster Pro 2 mix board isn't dreaming of a matrix right now. We're pretty, <laughs> sure it, we're pretty sure it isn't because we know how our reality works. But that's kind of the illustrative point, right? Right. Right. Well, yeah, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, how how would it be dreaming? Well, that's the point. Is it such a? It's so inconceivable. I'm not. So, but we're, I'm using, we're the creators of the board and the machines. We're the, are the creators, creators of, of the, the machi- matrix, and they know about we it. We made the machines, Mitchy. Yeah, and so, and the ma- the machines who created the the matrix are fully aware that the humans are dreaming. So yes. us as the creators of the soundboard should be aware if it's dreaming or not. My point, I was being, I wasn't literally talking about the soundboard machine. I was trying to illustrate what the film is saying, which is what you're now saying. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I get yeah, it. You, just, you get what I'm saying, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think the question of machines is interesting. Um, that, of course, is a big thrust of, like, again, a lot of the kind of philosophy being written about, particularly in relation to capital and labor at the time. Um, you know, you have uh, Felix, um, Guattari Felix at the time, who his big contribution ends up being that classic line of like, you know, all of human and cosmic praxis becomes a question of machines. Um, I want to talk, I definitely want to talk about the Merovingian, but I want to tie this off by just um, the fact that like, obviously the Wachowskis don't like um, America, capitalism, all of these things. Um, it's pretty, it's pretty <laughs> yeah. noteworthy. Um, I just want to y- give, y- yeah. <laughs> no, actually, you go, Mitch. I'm curious from your perspective. No, no, I was just going to say because that's an interesting point. Because one thing I wanted to say about the architect scene is that on all those TVs, you know, um, those monitors with all the random shit popping up. Um, when the architect mentions, architect he mentions uh, how bad humanity is, or you know how fundamentally flawed we are, and that's why they needed to account for this anomaly that is uh, the um, the one. He is like a bunch of images come up about history, and of course, there's Hitler there, right? You know, like when you're talking about how bad humans are, and then, and then one of the other major things that comes up, I'm pretty sure I didn't double check, is when George Bush Jr. announces the attack on 9 11, which is <laughs> which is timeline interesting because this movie came out only six months after 9 11, which when you know when you obviously when the first film came out, it didn't hadn't happened you say yet. It was 2003. Yeah. Yeah. No, didn't 9-11 happen in 2001? Oh, sorry. 18 months. Um, <laughs> did I say, what did I say? Six months. Um, 2001. Anyway, it happened. That wasn't right? me cinema first, sending you. I was just making sure I was following your point. <laughs> the first the first movie came out in 99, so it was before 9-11. And then this one came out 18 months after 9-11. And then they chose to put that scene in there when George Bush announces that um, thing, which is quite a well-known you know, um, speech, in parallel with Hitler. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> And yeah, and then, I mean, and, then, and then it's interesting because it's like I don't know, like it's 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 topically relevant in the American mind and to put that there. It's kind of like you know maybe a sensitive topic to touch on, right? From all the random kind of images you could put into a scene like that to exemplify human humanity's flaws. And then there's like a lot of like the the whole way that they get to the architect with all the keys and stuff like that is like a lot of like terrorist related kind of bombings and stuff like they blow up a lot of buildings and they take over a power, nuclear power plant. And it's like, I don't know, I don't know if it's anything intentional there, but it kind of seems a little bit like, you know, if, if you say that the Wachowskis are kind of like anti-American in some ways. Well, Maybe. the, the, the anti capitalism mm. anti, anti-establishment, and, and then it's... yeah, you could see that happening there. I wouldn't say they're... I wouldn't say they're anti-establishment because that's like anarchism is a whole different thing, but they definitely, these, t- these two have read the communist manifesto. Like I can probably guarantee that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, let, let me read you a section from chapter one. Um, Cause I think this will illustrate my point and you'll hear about the ways in of which what? the, of the communist manifesto. Um, you'll hear, <laughs> oh, that's you hear, why you're mentioning it. Cause you got it ready to go to read to us. <laughs> yeah. I do my homework, bro. Um, wait, 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 wait. Can you give me context on what this communist manifesto exactly is? Cause like, so this is a, Okay, this is a pamphlet that is written and handed out to try and help workers understand the things that are going wrong 
with the capital systems that they're currently engaging with. And yeah. the way that this kind of gets moved through history um, into the 60s and 70s, uh, and then, you know, into the, the, into the sci-fi material that the Wachowskis are cribbing off of, which is, again, all in this same kind of conversation. Um, the Communist Manifesto becomes the foundation for a lot of other writers taking it and embellishing on the ideas. Um, Guattari Felix is probably the most notable when it comes to machines. To the that's the guy I said before, who's you know his kind of biggest like physiological framework is that thing of like it's all a question of machines. But basically, it's designed to give workers an understanding of why their lives keep getting worse, even though some people keep getting richer. And right. this section specifically is about what production means. And if you think about machines and the ways in which there are so many machines out there, right? The numbers that they start to throw around of the machines coming to attack Zion are so much exponentially larger than the amount of people they've freed from the Matrix, even though they've been on a run at it the last six months. That there are so many people in the Matrix, right? For every machine, hmm. uh, sorry, for every human in the Matrix, there's a machine, at least one. There's, but there's more than that, right? So you've got to think about these numbers, 7 billion, 8 billion, you know, astronomical numbers of machines. Um, who, and all of the humans are asleep doing work that they don't know is in service of this, this other thing. So I'll give you this section to illustrate my point. Uh, quote, In these cities, a great part of not only the existing products, but also of the previously created productive forces, are periodically destroyed. In these crises, there breaks out an epidemic that, in all earlier epochs, would have seemed an absurdity. The epidemic of overproduction. Society suddenly finds itself put back into the state of momentary barbarism. It appears as if a famine, a universal war of devastation, had cut off the supply of every means of subsistence. Industry and commerce seem to be destroyed, and why? Because there is too much civilization, too much means of subsistence, too much industry, too much commerce. The productive forces at the disposal of society no longer tend to further the development of the conditions of bourgeoisie property. On the contrary, they have become too powerful for these conditions by which they are fettered. And so soon as they overcome these fetters, they bring disorder into the whole of bourgeoisie society, endanger the existence of bourge- and endanger the existence of bourgeoisie property. The conditions of bourgeoisie society are too narrow to comprise the wealth created by them. And how does the bourgeoisie how does the bourgeoisie get over these crises? On the one hand, by enforced destruction of a mass of productive forces, on the other, by the conquest of new markets and by the more thorough exploitation of the old ones. That is to say, by paving the way for more extensive and more destructive crises and by diminishing the means whereby crises are prevented. Owing to the, extens- owing to the extensive use of machinery and to the division of labour, the work of the proletarians has lost individual character and consequently all charm for the workman. He becomes an appendage of the machine. And it is only the most simple, most monotonous, and most easily acquired knack that is required of him. Hence, the cost of production of a workman is restricted almost entirely to the means of subsistence that he requires for maintenance and for the propagation of his race. But the price of a commodity, and therefore also of labor, is equal to its cost of production. In proportion, therefore, as the repulsiveness of the work increases, the wage decreases, nay, more, in proportion as the use of the machinery and division of labor increases, in the same proportion the burden of toil also increases, whether by prolongation of the working hours, by the increase of the work exacted in a given time, or by the increased speed of machinery. Which, for my mind, is epitomized by the matrix itself, where the work is so repulsive that they literally have to trap you in a dream so that you're a human battery that is unaware you're doing the work. Right. My point, maybe largely on the architect thing, is like we were talking about how it's all a cycle and a system, and like you know, there's no such thing as actual t- like self determinism and making choices. Is like these are all like it's like a ma- it's like a uh, a mouse in a maze, and each time the mouse escapes, they they've built a bigger maze to contain it, sort of thing. Um, and this is very much playing in that space and thinking about these ideas. Um, and I think the the use of the word machine specifically in the Matrix. Um, as a label for this system, you don't get much better of of allegory work uh, than than using the same language um, as the original text. For for my opinion, anyway. 
And so you reckon that, yeah, I mean, I could see that happening with the Wachowskis, I guess. That's your point, right? I, my, yeah, they my, might have got, gotten some inspiration from it. Yeah, or maybe my point is like the way that I read the film um, can yep. be read uh, through a kind of socialist lens um, and specifically kind of a, the the socialist lens presented at first blush in the Communist Manifesto. There are obviously different kind of vectors of where socialism goes and, and where communism goes. But yeah, it's a reading that I have of this film now that I feel really strongly about and that really resonates with me. And I wanted to kind of share that because I think it dovetailed nicely with the um, the architect discussions and the cycles discussions. I mean, the um, the the world that we started in the first movie, the sterile dystopia, is like the hyper capitalist world, is it not? Like mm. he's working in like this sterile fucking cubicle in an office building. Like, yeah, he's doing and, the like, severance that's, that's thing kind of, like of, the... of moving numbers in a column to another column. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. It's like it's like the kind of the only dis, like quality that we see of you know the quote unquote like world, the real world, or like I mean the Matrix world before um before he's awakened. So it's kind of like that's the that's the thing we we've we're left with uh, as a point of comparison, uh, you know, between Zion it's, it's, between the real world. Yeah, yeah, and it's hacking in the first story that lets him subvert capitalism and his work to actually make enough money to survive. Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he, but that's hacking reality because reality is defined by capitalism, which is the machines. Yeah, it, you can see. And then, how and then it what all... is Zion? What is it's... Zion in the real world in in terms of this analogy? Zion. It depends if you. It depends if you contend with the Baudrillard and you know the um, Borges stuff. But for me, if we think just about the kind of socialist reading of it, um, Zion is the solution, which is a place where money doesn't exist. Commerce mm-hmm. still exists. People still barter or trade for things, but mm-hmm. um, there isn't capitalist influence. Everybody's working toward the same effort, uh, which was also a big part of where communism came from um, or manifested itself in the 60s was countries sort of preeminently at war, perpetually at war, and that's what Zion is as well. And I think the film manages to critique some of those questions a little bit in really interesting ways. Um, and highlights the place of belief and ritual in those places hmm. but yeah because yeah think... they do believe don't they yeah like the and... council actually takes the prophecy very seriously right and they're wrong and <laughs> yeah, that's true. really that's really interesting to me like they're wrong about the one or they're they're correct but it you know they're they're not right about the one even if they are even if their belief is it's one of those like you know there's there's a way, way to describe that that i can't get to but yeah, yeah Zion, Zion is like the alternative uh, to that where everyone is working toward the same end and it's easy to do that when the same end is if we don't do this, we all die. But then even within that, everybody has different unique uh, motivations and relationships and perspectives and opinions and things they're trying to achieve. And so for me, Zion is sort of like the, it's the pitch of the other way of doing it, which is the ultimate pitch of the Communist Manifesto, which is like, what if we, it doesn't literally go like, what if we killed the bourgeoisie? But it's like, what if there wasn't a dominant ruling capitalist class? And then it goes from there. And then you get all of the writings that spring out of that, take that idea and run with it um, and kind of go from there. Yeah, it's interesting. It, it kind of, um, it, 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 it fits in well with the period of the Matrix, you know, writing on the back of like those those kind of emergent ideas of anti-capitalism in the nineties um, and modernism, you know, I think mm. it historically makes sense actually. Yeah. Especially oh, well, the, conserv- the conservative swing of Bush jr. As well. Yeah. And, and also the death of like communism in some sense, decades, a decade or two before that, you know, mm. and then, and then it kind of almost is a bounce back from that. Like yeah. the, the co- I mean, what you're reading is literally a communist manifest manifesto and, and, um, I don't know, people were probably I guess more against it during the Cold War, but then after the fall of the Soviet Union and the emergence of modern the you know, twenty first century and, and real modernism, they're like, Oh, you know, what about those ideas that were there in the past? Because they don't really exist anymore. I mean, you're hundred percent right. Yeah. It's, it's, it's interesting. F- Forty year swing toward conservatism started when they yeah, abolished or killed all of the countries that and, and to be clear, some of the communism you see Pre uh, predating 
the kind of 60s to 80s is not the yeah. same thing as what these texts end up being about. But yeah, you're, I, I certainly see your point. And, and right, agree. Okay. I, 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 I agree. I think it's it's 100% in conversation with that. <laughs> it is, of course, a way of all things. You see, there is only one constant. One universe, it is the only real truth. Causality. Action, reaction. Cause and effect. Everything begins with choice. No, wrong. Choice is an illusion created between those with power and those without. Look there at that woman. My God, just look at her. Affecting everyone around her, so obvious, so bourgeois, so boring. But wait. What, you see, I have sent her a dessert. A very special dessert. I wrote it myself. It starts so simply. Each line of the program creating a new effect just like poetry. First, a rush, heat, the heart flutters. You can see it now, yes? She does not understand why. Is it the wine? No. What is it then? What is the reason? And soon it does not matter. Soon the why and the reason are gone. And all that matters is the feeling itself. Now this is the nature of the universe. We struggle against it, we fight to deny it, but it is, of course, pretends it is a lie. Beneath our poised appearance, the truth is we are completely out. Um, I, I just want to say that this is a really horny movie, eh? Like, no, way hornier is, eh? than the first movie. Everything the Wachowskis make is horny, though, to be fair. Yeah, but it's no, it's still way hornier than the first movie. The first movie doesn't have any horniness at if, all, really. If this film came out today, that scene in the caves would be, everyone would be nude and fucking. Like, people are fucking, but they're not nude because it's, you know, the era. But Yeah, yeah. you got to look at the rating, though. Yeah, you got to keep appropriate. Although, actually, fun fact, this is the highest grossing R-rated film of all time up until Deadpool in 2016. Is this R-rated? In America, yeah, because they got, like, like Lord of the Rings is not R-rated, but uh. this is the same classification in, as Lord of the Rings in Australia, so we've got different ratings. But, like, it is actually yeah. pretty violent. There's quite a lot of blood in it. Um, I guess so. Really yeah, like that it. dude gets bloody impaled at the terminal Mitchie I'm just desensitized from the walking dead I'm like this isn't nothing this is nothing <laughs> oh no I'm, I'm totally desensitized too but I recognize when you know things are more violent in the rating anyway um but yeah no this is a pretty horny movie eh? and there actually are quite a lot of like uh naked bodies in that orgy scene there's a, yeah they hide them well should we talk about the horny thing which is the Merovingian yeah what's with like why, why are there so many lips in this movie like so many people <laughs> kissing and shit like like, like you know, um, not saying it's like a bad thing. I'm just curious. Like, it's very different to the first movie in that regard. And why? And the Merovingian, I think, is yeah, a critical kind of uh, a focal point of this. The horniness of the movie. A lot of sh- yeah, literally with the bloody slice of cake. Like, oh, watching what? that as a kid, man, I was like, what's going on here? Like, I was so confused and <laughs> why intrigued. Is she... I was like, is what's... she peeing herself? Like, <laughs> <laughs> that's actually what I thought, but. But yeah, no, but but I'm right in interpreting it as that she like orgasms, she, right? Yeah, from a cake. Let me set this. Okay, <laughs> because he you, wrote it. Do you want me to set the? Yeah, I, I can set you. Let me set the scene up, and then we can talk about the place of desire and how it relates to love, um, and how that relates to free will, which is the thing we were just talking about. We can talk about that. I don't have a particularly strong opinion, but so the. The the gang goes to the Merovingian, who is an he's uh, the way he's framed is he's one of the oldest programs, um, and the Merovingian dynasty. So he's named off the Merovingian dynasty, which was a rule. Um, they were uh, a ruling class of the Franks, which is what we think of as modern France between six forty and seven twenty. So, like uh, uh, you know, 
a little bit after the kind of what we consider to be the start of modern history. Uh, and they basically, through their efforts, they reshape the map into how we mostly recognize Europe today. So they kind of sorted a lot of the territory into the buckets that we now think of as the countries that exist in Europe. And the okay. Merovingian, they go to visit him because he has the key maker captive making mm-hmm. keys. And the Merovingian's framed as one of the oldest programs in the Matrix, which we now know that we've seen the film might mean he's been around for multiple cycles, right? He might have been here for he does, well, he do, he is. Right. He does he um, does comment on that. He's like, oh, oh you, he? when he when he says um um handle me and like oh something like that, I'll, I'll handle them. And he's like, oh, my, your predecessors were so much more polite or something like that. <laughs> there you go. Exactly. Yeah, there you go. And what happens is he's he's doing this big speech trying to prove a point about the only thing we really control is cause and effect. And as this happens, uh, we, we sort of have a woman where she's eating a, a cake that, as you said, he's written, not baked, noteworthy. And as she eats the cake, she comes to climax and has an orgasm that sort of punctuates his point about cause and effect, where he sort of says, you know, um, the only things it's the only thing we control cause, um, you know, causality, and then it beats, and then you cut to her, and then it's, he says effect, and then it's it's her orgasming, and then the next, yeah, the it's, very, it's very peculiar, it's very interesting, it's really strange, and the very next thing that happens is his wife, um, demands of Neo that Neo kiss her, the same way he kisses Trinity. Yeah. In payment for delivering the keymaker. What do what do we make? Because like those two things are literally next to each other. Uh what do we make of, of that, I guess, or, or <laughs> what does that elicit for us? Well I mean it the thing for me is that it, it casts her name is Persephone, right? So it casts the Merovingian as Hades. Yeah. Um and isn't there isn't there some sort of story about Persephone being infatuated with like someone from one of her subjects from elysium or some shit um i think that so. kind of there's, there's some parallels here with neo maybe yeah, yeah. well and, and and also that thing of like the matrix programs are built on the human history that existed when the machines took over and so they just sort of end mm. up patterning against these existing myths and things like that mm. Mm, interesting yeah and wh- why would a program be so sexually obsessed because it's patterned off of humans and humans. The, like it's literally it's what patch has said which is like in that mythology that's a really core cool part of like persephone specifically um and well, it's just a copied human right that, regardless of the period where we're, we're humans or was horny right and there's something indelibly human about that in comparison to the machines and to have a machine in this moment, be able to demonstrate some of that. And to, he even cheats on his wife, right? We get that supplied uh, by Persephone as well. I, I, I think it's deliberately confusing the concept of what a machine could be focused, interested, and feel. Like, these two characters who are both presumably programs have desire. They feel sexual mm. desire. They feel sexual pleasure. Um even love, like the when uh, when Persephone and, and and Neo kiss, Persephone turns to Trinity and she says, "You're, you know, you're." I don't know what she says exactly, but she's like, "You're so lucky." Like I'm so jealous of this, or whatever the line is. And I, I think yeah. Desire's place in the story is really central. You know, the first thing Neo and Trinity do when they get home is they have the most amount. Yeah. They, they keep trying to have sex, and it keeps getting interrupted. Uh, you know, Link operates. Nebuchadnezzar directly against the desires of his wife to be at home. There's this sort of everything in this film is about desire and the ways that it clashes with duty or that it clashes with your programming as it were, right? Like everyone is perpetually going to and coming from war in Zion. And I think that it's all there somewhere. I'm not sure why it's that way other than like, it's a deeply human need. And confusing yeah, I was just about to say that. Yeah. yeah. It's very human. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, desire clashing with your programming, it, it also draws the other, the opposite parallel of desire being your programming because when, when she's eating that cake, he says something like, um, you know, she's tr- she, her, everything about how, everything about her is that is trying to control herself right now. It's trying to maintain composure and whatnot. You know, what she's 
meant to do what she's supposed to do but at some point mm. she lets the desire take over and then that becomes the thing that is is important that you're meant to do is just uh relish the you know this feeling um and so which is what trinity does when she goes in to save neo despite knowing right. that she might die and the same with neo saving trinity hmm. so yeah yeah I don't know, something, something there about um <laughs> about uh ineffable programming that is or, or rather like um some sort of again some sort of anomaly introduced into a system that is all part of a bigger system that theme again yeah right i mean even smith is not immune to this you know he says i was compelled to stay compelled mm. to disobey like compelled is such a like he's compelled like it's it's inexplicable. These things just come upon you, and then when they do, you can't, you can't get away from them. Mm. But as we'll probably see in the next movie, that's probably architected by someone or something. Maybe, yeah. Right. Yeah. And are they subject to the same influences? Mm. You know, these are the questions. It also the film ends with a with a love story moment, right? You know, like it's at this film is ultimately mm. a big, a big picture yeah. about the relationship between Trinity and Neo, and it's like driven. It's a very romantic um, story in this particular movie. Yeah, I'll be honest. I got a little misty at the end when, you know, Neo saves Trinity, and it's like really fraught. But he pump pumps her heart back yeah, to life it's by crazy. being exactly. ghosting into her body. Like, what the fuck? Yeah. <laughs> Imagine how that feel. <laughs> it's wild. It's wild. Pulls a bullet th- out too. He put yeah. He pulls a bullet out. Starts a heart again. Yeah, it's yeah. It's a very it's, very like like very intimate. You know, you're not yeah. just doing CPR. You're literally grabbing a heart. <laughs> you're like <laughs> reaching through reality like that. You don't get much more <laughs> intimate than that. <laughs> yeah, no, it's really cool. Yeah, it's a, it's such a good film, guys. I love this film. Um, Never thought about the idea of like. Like resuscitating someone because that's the purpose of CPR, right? It's just to keep their heart pumping, but literally pumping their heart by actually grabbing it. Like, man, what a concept! It's not that he grabs it; it's that he zaps it. <laughs> no, he pump. He grabs it. You see the, his hand go around it. He, he goes and, around and, and, he and, squee- it, and, and, and then he, he squeezes, squeezes it a bit. But a charge. It's in the sound. You can hear it. A charge passes from him to her. Right. Yeah. And then and then in the code vision. Um, he yeah it's like very white right like that which is also um that that's also what you see when the the girl orgasms from the cake yes and it's also this it's it's electricity right it's energy which is what neo's then able to do he's then able to disrupt the machines and they're in the real right yeah it's like in the code world like the, the the when in the code vision it looks like not code like something something external else. to that you know it's like and then when the when the orgasm is portrayed like that as well it's like you know it's interesting because like yeah out of all the human things you know like orgasm is one of those like intangibly kind of like we intangible things that you just can't really describe like it's just like a feeling of that that cannot really be like probably replicated by machine right um so it kind of makes sense and then yeah. so there's a resuscitation as well. Yeah, hundred percent. It's very interesting. I, yeah. I like the um, I like the visual parallel of between the first and second movie of Neo raising up his hand and stopping the bullets in the first movie and the robots in this movie. It's a, it's a great way to bookend it. Oh, it's just wait brilliant. what? That wait what? In, yeah, when he puts his hand up and stops the robots, it's like a mirror of like in the first movie when oh. he stops the bullets. And in this in this one too. Yeah. Yeah, but, well, yeah, but in yeah, the yeah. in the in the first one, it's after he's come back to life, and in this one, it's after he's brought Trinity back to life. Mm. But it's in the real. Yeah. So, um, Pat, I, I imagine you don't really remember what happens in the third movie. I remember there's a big fuck off like battle. <laughs> Dragon scene. Ball Z fight. Yeah. Oh yeah, in the Dragon Ball Z fight. That's that's about it. Yeah. yeah. Wait, what were you gonna say? Uh, I, I don't know. Bloody um, Pacific Rim fight. Pacific, well, not Pacific Rim. I don't know, like well, you know those robots. It's in this. Yeah, movie like too. like an alien, in... the alien mech suit fight. Yeah, yeah, mech yeah. suit. Yeah, well, I guess aliens a good a classic example of that. <laughs> aliens, I, I don't, aliens. I'm thinking more of like Warhammer or something. Um, 
but um okay so if you don't remember the third movie because i do and i imagine you do too david and exactly what why neo does that at the end what do you think happened what do i think will happen in the third movie well why do you think neo was able to do that destroy the sentinels at the end of the movie in the real? oh um I, I don't know if i if i recall it has something to do with yet yet another revelation that it's all you know they're still inside some sort of system not not like yeah. not necessarily a, a literal they're inside another literal matrix per se but there is some sort of vague <laughs> do some rick and morty how, shit yeah there there's some vague notion about how like the this you know once again this was all orchestrated and um they they the humans and the robots are inexorably connected somehow i i remember yeah i remember uh there's a like neo becomes robot jesus or something at the end of that movie as well um, <laughs> yeah. another another cool thing i remember from that movie is the beginning i remember there's a really cool beginning scene where there's like a child at a train station i remember i, remember I really liked that oh yeah that's and it's yeah. renowned for being filmed in the bloody sydney, sydney. train station Do you guys oh really yeah. actually you know what well, i didn't realize I... you know that the oh, scene God, in the sure. first movie with the red dress is actually just a really kind of common spot in the middle of Sydney, and I, I you, didn't actually notice it. <laughs> would you like to know my anecdote? This you did that brilliantly. I didn't have to do any segue work. I have a personal anecdote about that red dress scene and location. Right. Well, you got pissed, blind, drunk next to that fountain, <laughs> threw up in it. So my dad, uh, my dad, in the years when uh, he uh, lived in Sydney for work and commuted back and forth, when I didn't really see him that much. Uh, he used to work in a building uh, in Sydney mm-hmm. and he would go up to his office every day. And one day, uh, and it, it was the kind of building that was constructed such that there was a uh, pretty common, there's a cafe on the ground floor and then you go up and then you're in, you're in your office building. One day he, went, he tries to go in and it's all roped off and there's all these big cameras out. And there's all these crew yeah. and there's all these people. Um, and he walks up and he realizes he can't get through to the lifts to get into his office. And so he sort of paces back and forth for a minute. And there's some dude sitting on a step um, drinking a coffee, just some guy. Uh, and dad walks up to him. And it seems like he's related to the stuff he doesn't know. Dad walks up to him. He goes, hey, um, I kind of need to get through to, like, to get to my job. Like, I'm kind of late for a meeting right now because I can't get through. The guy goes, I'll just, I'll, I'll walk you through. They should let me walk you through. So he walks him through, shake hands, and dad doesn't think anything of it. Uh when the Matrix comes out, Dad goes, "Holy shit! That that was Keanu Reeves that walked me through the set." Really? I shook my hand. Yeah. As if he didn't recognize him. Didn't recognize him from Bill and Ted's. Didn't <laughs> recognize <adventures. him. laughs> Well, I said Speed was the thing. I was like, "How did you not know from Speed?" But he was like, "I just didn't," because my dad was a sci-fi guy, fa- sci-fi yeah, fantasy yeah, guy, enough. and, this and was he, he first... honestly wasn't that famous before the Matrix, no. right? Yeah. Uh, and so that that's my like fun um, anecdote about that shoot is he used huh. to work in one of the buildings in there, and and yeah, yeah, I didn't ba- realize they just filmed the whole movie in Sydney, basically, like all the city scenes and stuff. Yeah, well, they and then the, the second two as well. Um, the because yeah. that because that train station every time I go to Sydney I always end up going through that train station because it's up by North Key, so you kind of always go through it um, if you're going to the harbour. Uh, Just fun Australia. Like the, the, the the underground station in the third movie. Yeah, the one where it's like the. I almost said it. Uh, the the one that we were talking about before, with the kid. Almost spoiled. Yeah, no, it really put Sydney on the the film map. Apparently. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Absolutely. It's good stuff. Only, well, I'm looking forward to the it. only film location I've been to is the one in Brisbane where they shot that one scene in Thor Ragnarok. <laughs> At like oh, the that's right, Warner yeah. Brothers Studios? No, no, it was just somewhere in the CBD. <laughs> like, it, you can just recognize the backgrounds. It's where Loki it's and some... Thor are in, C- yeah. in CV dress. Yeah, they get yeah, teleported to, to find their, um, their father, yeah. 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 Wow. I think um, it's a. Is that a fitting place to end? No, no. I wanted to talk about filming, actually. Okay. The special effects in this film and the action, just briefly. Okay. How good's the fucking action in this movie? Say more. Yeah, it's pretty good. It, it's pretty good. It's it's great. Um, well, the so the burly brawl is the scene where I don't know why it's called that. It's a scene where Neo beats up one hundred Smiths, right? It's because of the song, but yeah, go on. Oh, really? Okay. Fair enough. Um, 
and it's really cool because uh, in terms of like the technology of filming that, it's it's kind of cutting edge, really. Um, I think they had tried it or kind of done similar things with a few movies prior, but it wasn't like crazy um, and, and, you know, so technologically advanced as they did in this film. But um, but the concept of bullet time, which I don't think we really discussed in our last podcast, but it's actually quite pertinent and important because The Matrix really kind of made it a big thing uh, in the film industry. Um, it's really interesting, and I'm sure you two know about it, but it's like the idea where, you know, if you got to film something and moving in, well, if you want to portray something in slow motion, but then you need to move the camera very quickly around something that's moving very slow, how do you do that? Um, yeah. And the, so the solution is an array of DSLRs set at varying focal lengths that then shoot on a combined rig trigger at set yeah. intervals that match your frame rate of the high speed. Yeah. And then you change the orientation like of those cameras in ways so that it matches how the camera moves within the movie itself, what we see. So it was all in a, it was all, aside from the actors like Neo when he dodges the bullets in the first movie, um, he's the only thing that's like actually live action, I suppose, in when that thing is being filmed through that technique. And then everything around him is a green screen. And then what they do is, is that they take the images of wherever that scene is supposed to be set, which is on top of that roof on that building. And then they impose that on the green screen rather than like computer generating entire, you know, new scenery from scratch. And so that's why it looks really good. Everything blends in really well. Um, and obviously when it came to the the Burley Brawl scene, it's like, how do you do that when you've got 100 moving Hugo Weavings and one Keanu Reeves and they've got to be coordinated doing all this Kung Fu stuff? Um, it's more or less impossible, at least practically speaking, because you you need to film every like pit, bit of it so over many times and whatnot. And it just, you know, it wouldn't work out um, in the production of it. So then they just came up with a new thing is that they just put it all virtually. And so just like they, what they did in the first movie where the surrounding scenery is put onto a green screen, but it's initially the data is taken from a real spot, i.e. The, um, the real bit on top of that skyscraper. They took all the faces of the actors within those scenes whenever they needed it. And they took the data of people's um, faces and then they were able to use that to actually generate them in a computer generated way but in a way that actually looked very realistic rather than generating them from scratch um and it's just kind of peculiar so and then and then and then what they did is that they put the characters in the in the scene and then they emulated exactly what they did with bullet time in the first movie but they used virtual cameras rather than actual real life cameras and so after a certain point within that scene it seems like everything is actually com well nothing is really computer generated in the sense that it originates from real photos, real videos of real things, but then they kind of tie it all together in a way where it is actually in a computer, in a virtual environment. And yeah, it's, it's, it's just like, fascinating. It's like, it's like old school photo scanning basically. Yeah. But I'm really well for yeah, such I, a complicated scene and it looks fucking great. It still for holds 2003 up. It's, honestly. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Like how crazy is it? Like, I mean, you know, I don't know anything about like how special effects and CGI exactly works, but you can still watch movies these days. And, you know, when there's like a bloody, uh, you know, um, dinosaur or something and it needs to be totally like generated on by a computer, it looks really bad. Even today, it can still not look very convincing because I guess you don't have the original data to take from because there's no such thing as a real dinosaur. Um you know, that you can take the sample data from in order to construct a virtual model of it. Uh, it was just interesting. I never really thought about it, but apparently it's cutting edge for them. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, yeah, light, lighting has always been the enemy of uh, early CGI. That's why in, in Jurassic Park, they for the T-Rex, they chose that, that scene where it has very harsh lights against, you know, like a night backdrop. And that's, yeah. that's a lot more, it's easy easier to make convincing than, you know, a flat sort of diffused light in a, yeah, well, and then they built they built the animatronics, so they had reference, they had in camera yeah, reference yeah, footage right. that they could then put over, they could then you know roto over because they know what it should look like in the frame. Mm. Which is and yeah. that's the the biggest issue with Marvel current or Marvel's like production pipeline as it has been recently is they they don't know what things are going to look like until they get into the post production process. So there's no way to capture yeah. reference footage, so nothing ever feels like it matches. Uh, 
And yet, and, yeah, in this one, they did it so well, though. And, and it goes for so long, too, which is, which is what really impressed me. Like, it just kept going. Like, yeah, I know. Out, like... <laughs> It, it, has... it, it kind of reminds me of like you know that Unreal Engine Five simulation you can download and it's actually the Matrix. Yeah. No. It actually looks like that. What? <laughs> oh. oh, next time you're over, you uh, do you have a PS Five, Pat? Yeah. It, it's it's free on your PlayStation. It. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's like a just a demo of the Unreal Engine Five, I think it is. But it's the and Matrix. they just use the Matrix as like the gimmick behind demonstrating it. Oh, and then you, okay. you can just explore a world that looks hyper realistic because it's, it's on Unreal Engine Five. How good it looks! Yeah, interesting. Uh-huh. Um, and that was already like what, like a year or two ago. And there's that another was one out anyway. Three years ago, Mitchie. That was a minute. Oh my goodness! What that that came out three years ago? Yeah, I guess it did, didn't it? Yeah, it was before I bought my. <laughs> so I remember phone, it came so out it with the series around the Series X. Yeah, came out at least three. Years. Um. But yeah, no, nah, that action scene is fantastic. I love it. And actually, the, the action in this movie in general, I've already said it, but it's like, yeah, I, I rate it. It's like, I think it's much better than the first movie. Way I think more it's shit going on. It's different. It's so like here's, a sequel. Here's, here, yeah. Huh. What if there was a two in it somewhere? No, for me, it's different. Like, the first film is very much about the, um, the individual exchange of blows, right? It's very yeah. much like, bah, 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 like it, it's sort of, um, there's a, there's definitely a kind of uh, wushu film uh, style to the fighting where every single hit is about timing and blocking and movement and you're trying to you're trying to outmaneuver them. This film has that still in some places, but it's much more about because Neo is super powered now, like like properly mm. confined, do all kinds of crazy shit. He will frequently bend reality to avoid having to worry about the specific exchanges in that way. And that's really interesting as like a ch- uh, stylistic choice, what this fighting ends up being, right? Especially when you do have those moments where that returns, where those individual exchanges return. You know, the film starts with the agents arrive at the meeting um, and, you know, they come in and, and Neo just sort of blocks them all with one hand. And then he yeah. goes to, mm. and then, and then one of them goes to hit him and he's like, whoa, upgrades. And it's yeah. sort of, <laughs> it forces him to approach it differently. And that's why the, f- the style of the action feels so much more uh, or so much differently motivated. And what Neo is doing is differently motivated. Is like that stuff doesn't work anymore. That's no longer sufficient. That's a, that's a good point. It, the film prefaces the, the shift in action choreography. That's yeah, that's cool. Yeah. 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 There's a lot more blowing up in this and, and then flying the still turns Flipping. that shit up <laughs> to like Sorry? 25 in the next film. It turns it up again. Yeah, but but not in a good way. Yeah, you know, not not like how this this feels like a a good sequel. You know, everyone wants to go to a sequel and like, I don't know, Die Hard and then Die Hard Two or whatever the sequels are called. You know, I'm sure the explosions get bigger with each one, right? Um, I don't know, I haven't really seen any of them, uh, but it's like what you want from a sequel. You want more shit, uh, and this does it really well. Like it, it keeps a balance of like, yeah, like you're saying, David, like the 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 original stuff is there there's still a lot of the martial arts and stuff like that but then it, it builds on top of that but the third movie is just kind of like all right this is getting a bit ludicrous you know that he <laughs> i will i mean i, I don't know the final out, fight's kind of cool with smith and, f- between smith and neo <laughs> it is kind of cool th- the third matrix film is mostly not action it's mostly people talking is so it like, e- i remember your... lots of sentinels being shot up by exosuits and in that final fight you'll be surprised by how much of it is people totally and it's short talking. too the, the this, movie's only like 100 minute, minutes right while well, these this, two are both like two hours 20 this film is so long the film we just watched is so it's two hours fifth two hours 18 but minutes it doesn't i reckon it it, it it does it well though it doesn't yeah, feel it too long by. and all the scenes kind of like slot in one after the other very well yeah but it's long for like what it is I think the comparison to June is probably apt. Yeah, like, well, this is my point. Like, you just the comparison fill it with action. To, it's so good. To June makes sense to me because it's like, it's paced so impeccably. Yeah. Yeah. J- June's a different, even though we just started off the podcast saying these two movies are identical, it's really a different kettle of fish, isn't it? Yeah, my, my, <laughs> point, my point is like the pacing, different... though, especially if, especially if that sequel, it has the same kind of kinesis to it where... It, it's big beats of action and, and momentum, and then it's long sections of argument and conversation, then it's another big beat. Like, it sort of has the same 
It has similar rhythms, is my point. Yeah, yeah, I suppose, yeah. Um, although in the second half of the Mat- this Matrix film, it kind of just becomes mostly just action. Well, I yeah. suppose then you have the architect scene, though, so that, yeah. that's not really I, true. Breaks it up. Yeah. I remember, um, I, remember uh, I think, uh, Jared Bow was saying that, like, because he, he's a fucking, he loves the Matrix. He was saying that, like, unlike the first film, this movie does not blend action and philosophy. It, it is action and philosophy. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Uh, that's a good way of putting it. Mm. And the third film is philosophy that has some action in it. <laughs> is how I remember is it. Is it? That's how I think of it. Yeah. I'm keen to watch it now, but I mean, this whole movie is literally designed to set you up to be keen because it ends on a bloody cliffhanger. Um, the biggest cliffhanger. How did Neo destroy those Sentinels? What's going to happen with this bloody Bane? You know they shot them together, right? Yes. Yeah, yeah, I know. Yeah. yeah. But, I mean, the, the, and the third one comes out, came out six months after this one. The Wild. biggest cliffhanger. Even bigger than the ending of Pirates of the Caribbean 2, Mitchie? That was a pretty big cliffhanger. Is it? What <laughs> no, the end of that? I, I'm being funny. But uh, it, Norrington gets, the, it gets David Jones's heart. That's basically what happens. Uh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah true. That, that that's kind of funny. That number two and three together of the Paris yeah, and Caribbean that, are also kind of like a, joined. That was a phenomenon in the early two thousands. Apparently, like do, <laughs> doing the t- third, second, and third films as like one big project, Lord, Lord of yeah. the Rings did it too. Yeah, Lord of the Rings. Yeah, what? How? They filmed the back to back. Oh, filmed it back to back, but the story isn't necessarily very joined between two and three. Is it? It's not really. Oh, yeah. I mean, no, you're right. Yeah, the ends are destroyed. Yeah, yeah and then and then they get yeah, the bloody kind of directly. Yeah, true. yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, like, it's, it's like, you been pretty linked. More connected than than like. <laughs> but then the second one is same with the th- first one. Um, Pippin and Mary are taken by the Urukai, and then they um in the second movie at the start they go and find them. Yeah, it's a it's a good they're good films. It's a trilogy. Yes. Yeah, yeah, but it's like they they joined seamlessly oh my, between my point three of my them. point is that they were filmed back to back and they have that same connection i understand they are different films <laughs> in different trilogies no, 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 but i'm saying i'm saying like like pirates of the caribbean and matrix the second and third film seem like story-wise very joined and then the first film is just offset and it has nothing to do with really the second and third one yeah well I, it, it's because uh, like lord of the rings is an exception where they knew they were going to film all three right whereas like matrix and pirates they filmed the first Correct. one it was massive su- success and then they were like all right we're gonna do more yeah they had the money f- to do all three yeah. very good point pat that's exactly probably why 100 <laughs> percent didn't think about it um anyway we're yeah. done everyone's yeah. got what they wanted yeah. to say off the chest it's i i very quickly <laughs> just to put him on blast um i got a text from darf last night and he was like I was like, oh, I'm trying to reschedule a recording thing with the Star Wars guys uh, on the weekend. And he was like, sorry, I can't do this weekend um, because Friday night I'm going to see The Lord of the Rings and then Saturday night I'm going to see The Lord of the Rings and then Sunday night I'm going to see The Lord of the Rings. <laughs> and he is going to a... He's going to the uh, where he lives in Texas. They're doing a three-day screening of the extended Lord of the Rings films mm-hmm. where you sort of... You go to one each day Um and I had to admit that for my and listen, be cool, everybody, be cool about it. For my, uh, I think I th- would have been sixteenth birthday. We yeah. uh, we packed into my parents' basement and we watched the three Lord of the Rings extended cuts back to back. That was my. Yeah, that was what time. we did. It was great. I will say, um, extended, the, huh? Back to back extended editions. Yeah. It was like right. we started at 10 a.m. We finished at like 1 a.m. Like it was a mission. Um, Interesting. Yeah, but it was great, uh, and I don't regret it um, at all. So, but I just want to point out that like when I'm putting Darth on blast for not being available, I get it. So yeah, I just want you all to know guys, the type of nerd that we're dealing with. You guys covering that new Star Wars show? I haven't decided. I can't tell if I'm gonna like it or hate it. Anything that involves Jedi directly, I'm like put put it. Is in it the a bin. new new one? It's new well it's new new yeah it's new material What's it called? but it's set in, it's star wars acolyte oh yeah it looks it looks kind of looks kind of bad tbh <laughs> <laughs> i and why is that it's all the stuff i don't like about star wars it's like just what 
Just watch the it's trailer. Carrie, actually, like... it's Carrie Ann Moss who's in this film, oh. so it connects. It oh, connects. it's a film. No, it's a show. Oh, oh, in in I'm the Matrix. Trinity yeah, yeah. is in yes. the Matrix and also in Acolyte. That's your. She's also in Matrix Revolutions. What? <laughs> Whoa! <laughs> Whoa! It's She's not, also guys, in Memento. These, these. Oh my God, guys! The, the coincidence. Is she not? <laughs> yeah, she's she Memento. She's, she's in also Memento. in yeah. Jones, yeah. mate. She is. True. Okay, yeah. I haven't she's, seen him much. She's also in that, Daredevil for like one scene in season three. And that is all the things she's in. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> pretty much. Don't eh? look it up. <laughs> um, don't look what up. I need like a sign I can hold up that just says humor to Mitchie. Um, <laughs> I think at this point. I thought you were implying that maybe, you know, if we look it up, we find something that. Yeah, find we... some like porno she's in or something. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's, you said it. I was thinking it. <laughs> <laughs> That's wild. That's not what I meant at all. I just meant like, don't Google it because we're never wrong. But like, y'all took it to somewhere else. Like, that's, and that's on you guys. <laughs> that's on a method to the madness, let me just say. That's not, I don't take any accountability for that. Yeah, great minds think alike. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Anyway, anyway, are we keen to wrap up? Yep. Yeah. 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 I said I was done thirty minutes ago, so for me this has just been like a nice, pro- like a nice. You, you were the one that decided to have an epilogue on Lord of the Rings extended editions. It came up naturally. I'm. So- You're the guy that last <laughs> time up. you were like, "We'll just cut it out. We'll keep talking." You sound like Piers. <laughs> yeah. All right. Anyway, that uh, wraps up our podcast on Matrix, The Matrix Reloaded. Uh, plugs. David, do you want to plug? He can't even improvise the sentence. Um, that's fine. <laughs> that's the point. It, it you... should have been something like, where can, what, where, what do you have? To, where can people find you? Like, anyway, it's fine. Um, look, you guys know that's Zero and the nature Dead. of our podcast. I understand. Sorry. No, it's fine. Um, <laughs> Zeroended.com uh, is where you can find all this stuff. I do, I'm sure if you're a fan of Method to the Madness, you or across what I do. Uh, you can follow me and Pat covering Daredevil. Uh, by the time this comes out, our Defenders coverage will have started in the lead-up to Season 3 of Daredevil. You can find my books at underink.press. If you like the kinds of things I talk about, you're probably going to like the kinds of books that I write. My main series is the Main Trick series, which is a low sci-fi uh, kind of science fantasy coming-of-age story. And I wrote a book about Sherlock uh, and the fandom that existed around it and everything that went wrong uh, with their fan conspiracies on tumblr if you kind of are interested in that definitely check it out uh it was really fun to put together and actually have a book of video game essays that i published last year called pale runner uh, which kind of follows my journey through a pretty significant breakup while also writing about video games and how that influenced the actual writing of those essays themselves so definitely go check that out if you're interested otherwise pat where can people find you guys on the internet uh, we exist on YouTube, Spotify, SoundCloud, Apple Podcasts, and Stitcher. Search up A Method to the Madness podcast. Add the podcast at the end, or else you won't find us. Um, we have a website, amttm.com. Uh, our socials are on there. If, you, if you're more into video stuff, watch our watch. Go to our YouTube channel because we have video only content on there, uh, with, like tier lists and stuff. Watch the Typical watch the YouTube breaking. Crap. What's the Breaking Bad conspiracies tier list? I'm obsessed, I'm <laughs> yeah, it's obsessed with good. it. It's so good. <laughs> yeah, like, were you ever curious um, whether it's all a dream? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that was the worst one. No, nah, but the, the, mean, the Gus Fring theories are pretty cool, though. Yeah, some of them are really dumb, but some of them are, like, really fascinating. Yeah. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. What is it that Morpheus says at the end of this film? Hang on, I close my notes, but I can I can tie this together, guys. Morpheus says, "I have dreamed a dream, but now that dream is gone from me." Thanks for listening. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye.